All right. Welcome to Psychopharmacology. It's week one. Obviously, there's two professors, me, Richard Collado, and Professor Smith, Peter Smith. Okay. This is important. Remember, the neuron is the functional unit of the brain, right? So a lot of our medications are going to work on this. And the reason why it's important for you to understand this, because you will be doing a lot of medication teaching for your patient, all right? Some of our patients are going to be low-functioning, and we have to explain it very simply. And some are going to be more high-functioning, and we have to kind of break it down for them. And, you know, they're going to ask, how does the medication work in my brain, right? So in, in a general sense, the meds work on neurons, right? So you have communication between a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. So let's say, for example, this is a presynaptic neuron, all right? So in the very beginning, there's going to be two types of neurotransmission I want you guys to know, all right? There's electrical neurotransmission, right, which is what travels through the axon. So you guys all learned that in nursing school, right, the action potential, right, and there's resting membrane potential. Whenever you hit that, that, that middle initial uh, potential, right, it's going to cause an action potential that goes down, right, and it's going to cause chemical neurotransmission, which is the neurotransmitters that we're actually trying to control with the medications, right? So if someone is depressed, in a general sense, we're trying to increase monoamines, right? So there's three of them. We have serotonin, which everyone knows about, right? The feel-good neurotransmitter. We have dopamine, right? Which is drive, motivation. When it gets a little bit too high, that can cause psychosis. It also is implicated in addiction. And we also have norepinephrine, right? Norepinephrine is very important because we need that for energy. So if a patient comes to you with depression, right, in your mind, you should already start thinking what, you know, what neuromodulation technique am I going to try to use, right? I'm probably going to try to increase norepinephrine in that patient's brain. You have many options, right? We have Effexor, you have duloxetine, you have Welbutrin. These are three classes of medications that can increase dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain, all right? So you're matching dysfunctional circuits in the brain, right? And you're going to, and that's how you're going to kind of think what kind of medication might help this patient, all right? This is what I was talking about. So this is just one neuron talking to a second neuron, all right? So obviously the presynaptic neuron is the one in the top, all right? An action potential happens, it goes down the concentration gradient, it works its way down, right? And when it gets to the, that, in, that synaptic terminal, which is where the, the control point is between the presynaptic talking to the postsynaptic, that's kind of like where all of the meds kind of work, right? So if you want to modulate depression, you want to increase serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine in that middle area right there, where A, B, and C are, all right? So the reason why reuptake is important is because reuptake is the way it recycles neurotransmitters. Remember, our bodies don't really like to waste. It wants to be very efficient. So instead of creating new neurotransmitters, right, like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, when it's released, your body kind of wants to recycle it. One way of recycling is called a reuptake pump. So we have three main reuptake pumps in the brain. You have CERT which stands for serotonin reuptake transmission, right? You have NET, which stands for norepinephrine transporter, right? And you have DAT, which is dopamine transporter. So those three, once they work their magic in the postsynaptic neuron, they have to be reuptaked again, all right? Now, if you look at the vesicle there, that vesicle is where it's kind of like stored and recycled again. So later on, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about schizophrenia and, and side effects of it. You need that vesicle to suck in those neurotransmitters for it to be recycled. So... It has to go inside the presynaptic neuron first using the reuptake pump, all right? So it goes inside the cytoplasm of the neuron. It's gonna be floating around the cytoplasm, and if it doesn't go inside a vesicle, it'll get reuptake by a vesicle. It's actually not safe. It's gonna get destroyed by monoamine oxidase, all right? We do have medications called MAO inhibitors or monoamine oxidase inhibitors that eat up all of those neurotransmitters that aren't safe, that don't go inside the vesicle, all right? So that's important later on. Obviously, in the postsynaptic neuron, you have very different, you have different receptors, right? There's many receptors. You know, there's dozens of uh, serotonin receptors. You know, there's about five dopamine receptors that are significant. We have a bunch of norepinephrine re uh, receptors and other neurotransmitters also. All right. So, you have reuptake. You have diffusion, right? Which goes from uh, high concentration to low concentration. You have degradation, which is the monoamine oxidase, which I talked about. All right. These are just different ways that our body kind of recycles and doesn't use a lot of energy for neurotransmitters to be used again, okay? Types of, neuro, of neurotransmission. So anterior grade is what I talked about, going from presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron, all right? So whether that's a dopamine neuron secreting dopamine to postsynaptic neuron, whether it's a norepinephrine neuron secreting norepinephrine to a postsynaptic neuron, or a serotonin neuron releasing serotonin to another postsynaptic neuron, all right? So it goes from you know, pre to post. Retro goes the other way. It goes from post to pre, 
right? So if anyone says, what is retrograde neurotransmission? It means that that postsynaptic neuron is communicating backwards. So the presynaptic neuron, give you an example, might communicate to a postsynaptic neuron, right? And for instance, that postsynaptic neuron can communicate backwards, whether it's secreting uh, nitric oxide is a good example, all right? Or secreting um, neural growth factor, which increases the connections between those neurotransmitters, all right? Uh, there's a few more, but you know, there's just some examples. Volume neurotransmission means that it doesn't just go from a pre to a post, but a pre can actually you know, float and go further away. So for instance, a pre and a post might talk, right? But it, float, it might float a little bit more. A good example of that is in the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe utilizes a lot of uh, volume neurotransmission. So what that means is that you don't have a lot of DAT, right, in, in the frontal lobe. That, like I mentioned, is dopamine transport system. So what happens is a presynaptic neuron might spit out dopamine and it's not going to get eaten up right away, right? Because you don't have a lot of dopamine reuptake pumps there. So it might float around. It might hit, you know, a little distal part of your brain and it floats there. And it makes sense, right? Because obviously I'm talking to you now. I'm focused. I'm alert, right? I need dopamine in my frontal lobe in order to communicate this material to you. And at the same time, you guys need dopamine in your frontal lobe also to understand the material that I'm explaining to you, right? If there's anything wrong with that, obviously that can be symptoms of ADHD, right? Or cognitive dysfunction related to depression or anxiety, right? If there's not enough dopamine, our body really needs dopamine for a lot of things. So you'll understand with the regulation later on that we need to keep that pretty constant, all right? Once again, anterior grade neurotransmitter, presynaptic neuron, going to postsynaptic neuron, all right? Sometimes we call that classical, classical neurotransmission, all right? Retrograde goes backwards. Postsynaptic neuron communicating with a presynaptic neuron. Right, example, uh, growth factors, nitric oxide, cannabinoids. Right, our body, even though people are smoking weed, our body does create cannabinoids also. All right, volume neurotransmission, best example, dopamine in the frontal lobe. All right, is that clear? Okay, I'm going to stay in this because this is a little beefy and it is a little complicated, and I'll explain it as many times as I can. All right, so these are the five ways that our meds work. All right, so you have one way is called 12 transmembrane region transported, transported proteins. All right, we have G protein link, we have enzymes, and we have ligand gated ion channels, and we have voltage gated ion channels. All right, 12 transmembrane region transporter transporter proteins is an example of reuptake. All right, so if someone says, I'm giving my patient, I don't know, Prozac, all right, Prozac is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We classify that as 12 transmembrane region transporter mechanism of the way the medications work, right? It sounds fancy, but it just means that the protein goes in and out 12 times, all right? I didn't name it. That's what they named it, all right? G protein link means that there has to be a cascade of different second, third messengers or fourth messengers that have to work, all right? That means that it might take a while for the medications to work. Why is it that antipsychotics might take two weeks, right? A little longer to work because it's a G protein link obviously. So you have that first messenger needs to go to a second messenger, goes to a third messenger, which eventually will go inside the nucleus of the postsynaptic neuron, right? You know, all the magic is going to happen there, whether it's going to downregulate, upregulate receptors or create new proteins or increase connections to other parts of your brain. You know, it takes a while. That's why when patients ask, why does the medication, you know, take so long, you can explain to them, well, this is the mechanism, right? You don't have to say G protein link, but you can mention that it takes time for the meds to work. That's why it's important for them to take the meds every day, right? Because that has to be repeated over and over again for that process to happen. They have to keep taking the meds every day after breakfast, right? Or at night before they go to bed for that, you know, that um, cascade to work, okay? Enzymes. In psychiatry, we don't really have many medications that work in enzymes, just to name a few, but- um, Excuse me, yes, you, yes. can you please repeat the G-protein link again? Yes, G-protein link receptors have to bind to a G-protein. A G protein is a protein that's on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron, which needs to go through different cascades, right? There's different messengers. First, second, third, fourth. If you look, go on the, on the, on the um, style book, it breaks it down pretty well. But it, it's just a longer process. You don't have to memorize all of the steps of it, but just understand that it's a longer process and needs a G protein to work, all right? An example would be antipsychotic medications. Thank you. Enzymes, there's only a few that are relevant in psychiatry. Monoamine oxidase, 
is an example of an enzyme that works, um, you know, in psychiatry. Because remember what I mentioned, what does monoamine oxidase do? It breaks down neurotransmitters, right? So if someone has depression because, quote unquote, they don't have enough serotonin, don't have dopamine, maybe they have a hyperactive monoamine oxidase system that's eating up all the, all the neurotransmitters. So one way we can help that is by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitters, right? So let's inhibit monoamine oxidase. There's two types. There's monoamine oxidase A, monoamine oxidase B, all right? A, you know, breaks down certain neurotrans, B does specific ones. But just know that both of those have to be inhibited, okay? We do have selective medications for that also, all right? Another example is for Alzheimer's dementia, all right? Alzheimer's, we need more acetylcholine. How do I keep more acetylcholine in the synaptic club? Let's break down acetylcholinesterase, right? It's an enzyme that eats up acetylcholine. So how can I increase acetylcholine? Let's stop breaking it down by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase. All right, does that make sense? Ligand-gated ion channels. That would be benzodiazepines, right? They work pretty quickly, like Xanax. Why is it when someone takes Xanax, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, they're calm all of a sudden, right? Faster. Binds to the receptor, there's a receptor change, what happens is uh, Xanax goes on a PAM, which is called pal positive allosteric modulator, which increases the binding of GABA, which will increase chloride in the cell. What is chloride? Chloride is a negative ion, right? When you make a cell more negative, what happens? It repolarizes it, right? So you can't have an action potential, all right? So that's why people will be calmer. They might not have seizures, right? That's why we give benzos for seizures also, right? Because it's not firing. There's no action potential. You don't have the seizure. Right. Voltage gated ion channels could also be anticonvulsants, right? Like Depakote, carbamazepine, Tegretol, Lamotrigine. All right. Once again, I'm going to break it down. 12 transmembrane region transporters are the reuptake pumps. Okay. Good example serotonin reuptake inhibitors, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, dopamine reuptake inhibitors. All right. G protein link, antipsychotics, right? Takes a while to work. Some antidepressants also. Enzymes, two examples. Uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors in Alzheimer's dementia and monoamine oxidase, all right, for depression. Ligand gated. By the way, I'm just giving some examples. There's many more examples, but I'm just giving you the, you know, I'm just keeping it basic for now. Ligand gated are benzodiazepines, all right? Works pretty quickly. Once that conformation changes happen, it causes influx of chloride, which, you know, repolarizes the cell, hyperpolarizes it. There's no action potential. There's no seizures, controls anxiety. Might even be useful in mania, okay? Voltage-gated ion channels changes the voltage, right? And that would be anticonvulsants or mood stabilizers. Any questions? No? Okay. How do neurons adapt to medications? All right, obviously, like I mentioned, our brain is pretty smart. So, you know, it, it does something called upregulation and downregulation. So I'll give you an example, right? Someone has a dopamine excess due to mania or psychosis, right? How can I control that dopamine excess when there's too much dopamine? I can block the postsynaptic neuron, right? Pretty simple, right? So I can give them a dopamine blocker, a D2 antagonist, like Haldol, for instance, for psychosis. After a while, the brain is so used to that stimulation of dopamine, you know, it's going to do something called upregulation. Upregulation means that they were used to a specific dopamine tone. All of a sudden, it's not getting the dopamine tone, right? So it's smart. It's going to upregulate, which means it's going to create more receptors at that site, right? So once your brain is used to that, it's going to upregulate. So sometimes that can manifest as, okay, my meds stop working. I might need more meds, right? So I have to block more dopamine. Block those receptors that were kind of, you know, upregulating before. All right. Opposite happens too. What happens if someone abuses cocaine, right? Or a stimulant? If you keep stimulating those receptors, the body wants to go back to homeostasis, right? It's going to downregulate those receptors. This means that it's going to reduce the amount of receptors on the, the postsynaptic neuron. Okay. It happens post and pre also, but mostly post. Sensitization is similar concept. What it's going to do is those receptors are going to become more sensitive. All right the receptors that are being blocked are gonna become more sensitive. The opposite happens. You keep stimulating that receptor, it's gonna become desensitized, which means you need more, all right? These are important concepts when it comes to addiction, right? Why is it that someone might use a certain amount of cocaine, you know, then all of a sudden they don't feel that same hit anymore, right? Or that same euphoria, they wanna use a higher dose, 
because what happens to those receptors? They're going to desensitize, right? Desensitize and downregulate. The less receptors, less sensitive receptors, all right? The opposite. You're giving them something to block the receptor. The body wants homeostasis. They're going to start upregulating, creating receptors, and it's going to increase, uh, you know, sensitization, become more sensitive, all right? They go hand in hand. So upregulation goes with sensitization. Down regulation goes with desensitization. Kind of makes sense, right? It's craving what it had before. Does it make sense? Anyone need to repeat it again? You block Can you something. Just, yes. Sorry. Can you just repeat down regulation again? Yes. Down regulation is a way for the body to protect overstimulation. All right. So if someone is taking an agonist, right? Something that's simulating a receptor of a neuron, your body is like, whoa, it's too much stimulation. What can I do? It can do two things. It can start killing off receptors, which is called downregulation, right? Or the receptors that are there, it can make it desensitized, not as sensitive. So you need more of that chemical or whatever to get that same reaction, right? That explains tolerance. That explains, you know, people, you know, um, not responding to meds and you have to raise the dose. Because obviously your brain is always searching for homeostasis, what it was used to before. Questions? Thank you. Agonist spectrum. All right. Agonist spectrum means that, you know, there's a spectrum for the way our meds work. You can look at it as, you know, how strong is the medication? All right. So an agonist would actually mimic our regular neurotransmitters of our brain. Right. So for instance, you know, our body creates dopamine. So we need dopamine to learn, you know, to find pleasure, to have focus, right? To drive us to get up in the morning to attend this class. So when I give someone a medication that's going to increase dopamine, in a way, it's going to be called an agonist if it's close to that neurotransmitter, right? A partial agonist is probably the most complicated part because the partial agonist slash is also called a stabilizer. So a partial agonist can work as both. It can work as an agonist in the presence of not enough neurotransmitter, or it can work as an antagonist in the presence of too much neurotransmitter. So for instance, if I give someone a partial agonist and they're not having enough dopamine stimulation because they might have ADHD, right? It might work the opposite. It might increase the dopamine and help them focus a little bit, right? For instance, if I gave it to them for psychosis and, you know, they were having too much dopamine, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to decrease um, the amount of dopamine. Does that make sense? It's a stabilizer. It doesn't always work out perfectly, but, you know, in essence, we try to use partial agonists to kind of balance things out if we can, Okay. An antagonist on the other end blocks, right? But even though if you look at the book and you read the book, even though we have an antagonist on board of a receptor, a receptor still has something called intrinsic activity, which means that there's still gonna be a, a little cascade happening, all right? Because the, because the neuron needs to, to, to kind of like stay alive by having intrinsic activity still happening, whether it's maintaining its connections or building scaffolding proteins or you know creating vesicles inside, it needs that intrinsic activity just to kind of function, right? Think of it as like, basic, you know, basic needs of the cell, right? If you give an antagonist, that's still happening, right? There's still intrinsic activity. Inverse agonist, it blocks everything. So there's no intrinsic activity at all, all right? That's not really significant right now because we only have a couple in, uh, inverse agonists in psychiatry and I'll mention that in the future, but that's a fairly new concept and we don't really have too many, but just keep that in the back of your mind, okay? Agonist simulates a regular neurotransmitter in our body, all right? Whether it's dopamine, norepinephrine, or serotonin, or histamine. Partial agonist. In the presence of too much stimulation, it's gonna work as a net antagonist. It's gonna bring it down a little bit, all right? A partial agonist. In the presence of not enough stimulation, is gonna work as a net agonist. It's gonna increase that stimulation. That makes sense, all right? An antagonist is a blocker, but it doesn't fully block all of the, the activity. There's still gonna be something called intrinsic activity which is needed for the daily functioning of the neuron or the cell, okay? Inverse agonist blocks it and it blocks intrinsic activity, right? There's that, that, that neuron is literally shut down, doesn't do anything. There's no activity at all. Does that make any sense? Can you give an example of the last uh, thing you just discussed? An inverse agonist, inverse antagonist, I'm sorry, an inverse yes. agonist. Inverse when agonist. would that be oh. useful to completely shut it down? There is some in schizophrenia, there's a new medication that's a 5-HC2A inverse agonist, 
which only works at the 5H2A receptor, and that's an example. Or clozapine, which is also in schizophrenia, is considered a histaminic agon uh, inverse agonist at the histamine receptor. I don't want to confuse you guys now. It is significant when you get to schizophrenia, but you know, focus on this right now. But those are two examples that I can give you in psychiatry. All right. 5 h 2 a inverse agonist for schizophrenia. The medication is called pemavanserin. And uh, clozapine, which is also used in schizophrenia, which is a histamine inverse agonist. All right. These are just some examples of the dopamine pathway in the brain. We're going to cover this a lot, uh, but just know that there's different pathways. The reason why I like to bring this up early on in the beginning is because this explains a lot of the side effects of the medication. All right. For instance, I'm giving someone a dopamine blocker, all right, for psychosis. I don't want it to touch these different dopamine pathways, right? Because some pathways need dopamine, right? But unfortunately, we don't have the technology right now. When you give someone a medication, it goes in your mouth, right? Into your stomach, gets digested, goes through the hepatic portal vein, and it goes through first pass metabolism, and then it goes through systemic circulation, right? That's, that's in essence how it works. When it finally gets up into your brain, it's going to disperse and hit all these different pathways of the brain, right? Even though I only want it to affect the mesolimbic area, which is increased dopamine for psychosis, it's going to touch other parts like nigrostriatal, which is the pathway for movement, right? That's why when you give someone uh, antipsychotic medication, right, and it hits the nigrostriatal area, they might have stiffness, right? They might have Parkinsonism, tremors. They might have akathisia, right? You block dopamine in the tuberoid infundibular area. You need that for prolactin release, right? Dopamine works inversely with prolactin. So if you block dopamine, prolactin goes up. And what happens? Your prolactin should only be elevated if you're breastfeeding female, right? Because you're creating milk. But if you're a male who's, you know, obviously <laughs> you shouldn't have elevated prolactin, but you're taking, you know, antipsychotic medication, what happens is prolactin elevation can cause the infertility. It can, it can lead to, you know, uh, sexual dysfunction. It can also cause men to grow breasts, right? You don't want that. So that's why with our patients, you want to make sure you assess for that. And of course, we'll go over the antidotes for that also or how to adjust medication, but that's just a general sense, all right? So sometimes our meds are non-specific, not that we want, I mean, we want them to be more specific, but we can't, right? For example, you give someone Motrin, right? It works on prostaglandin, just to review from, you know, uh, for a physiology class, right? You That's, prostaglandins are, are implicated in pain, right? So you wanna block pain receptors, right? Then that's what prostaglandins do, but, you also have prostaglandins in your stomach and prostaglandins are, you know, needed to line your stomach with mucus, right? Why is that people will take NSAIDs, all of a sudden they start having, you know, pain in their stomach because you want it to affect one part, but it's inadvertently affecting the other part, right? Unfortunately, that's how side effects happen in all of our medication. It affects a lot of parts of the body. So we just want it to affect one part of the body, but inadvertently it affects another part. So we need to make sure that we balance it, whether we're reducing the dose, right? Or switching class of medications, or there might be drug drug interactions, for instance. Okay, so if I was to ask you, I'm giving someone someone. This is just an example of a question I'm asking you in the test, right? I'm giving someone a D2 blocker, right? You need to know what does dopamine do in the brain, right? It's implicated in psychosis. It's implicated in mood. It's implicated in pleasure. Patient all of a sudden starts having erectile dysfunction. All right, what part of the brain might be involved in that? I just told you, tuberoid infundibular area. If I said, why? Because it caused prolactin elevations, right? Prolactin is a hormone that's elevated that can cause sexual dysfunction in males, all right? Uh, if I asked you what part of the, of the dopamine pathway is implicated in psychosis, you would answer me mesolimbic area, right? Is dopamine too high or too low? And you would answer me dopamine is too high, right? Dopamine is too high in the mesolimbic area. What can I do to help with psychosis? I would give them an antipsychotic medication. Give me an example of antipsychotic medication. I might list some meds for you and you have to choose that, all right? I might say patient is having shuffling gait. Patient is having stiffness in their neck. What medication might have caused that side effect, right? And you would answer possibly a dopamine blocker. Why? Because dopamine is blocking, you know, movement, which is in the nigrostriatal pathway, all right? Mesocortical pathway, okay? That is implicated in focus and attention. So if you block dopamine and in that pathway, inadvertently, what's going to happen? People will have something called negative symptoms or difficulty focusing. Or they might come to your office and say, I have ADHD. But in reality, you know, it's not ADHD because it started when they started taking the antipsychotic medication, right? So you might tell that patient, I'm really sorry that you experienced that. It's probably because I went too high with your antipsychotic medication, 
And the, the patient's probably going to say, what do you mean? Well, you know, these are how the meds work. I really want to watch, I really want to block dopamine in one pathway, but unfortunately it might be blocking dopamine in your frontal lobe, right? Therefore you're having a hard time focusing. It's not ADHD. You have two options. I can either switch your medications, right? To something else that might not cause that side effect for you, or I might reduce the dose. See how it's all tying together now, right? Things that might be abstract when you're reading, why do I need to know these pathways? This is how you adjust your medication because just looking at these dopamine pathways already, I can troubleshoot patients side effects, right? Patient comes to you and says they feel depressed. They don't feel like they have joy anymore doing things they used to do, right? Like they used to have. Okay. When did it start? Well, it started about two weeks ago when my doctor started these new medications for me. Okay. What medication did your doctor start you? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. Was it a medication for psychosis? Yes. Okay. That should already light up your brain. Okay. Well, if it's a medication for psychosis, it's probably a medication that's blocking dopamine. All right. So therefore, dopamine is being blocked too much in the mesocortical area, right? So what do I need to do? Adjust the meds or switch medications, all right? A woman all of a sudden says, I haven't had my period in two months. When did it start? Well, if someone started me a medication for my psychosis, most likely it was a dopamine blocker, right? What does dopamine do? In males, it causes sexual dysfunction and gynecomastia. What does it do in females? It causes amenorrhea, right? Women are not going to have their period, and it's going to stop until you regulate it. You have to increase dopamine one way, right? Whether you reduce the dose, or you can give them an extra credit question. What medication can I give them that might increase dopamine in the presence of not enough dopamine? A PA. What's a PA? Partial agonist. Very good partial agonist, right? That would be a good example of giving someone dopamine in a pathway that they need dopamine. Understand? I have a question. Yes. Um, for the patient, the example you gave where a um, patient became depressed after starting um, a medication for psychosis, would you consider starting them on an antidepressant or would the antidepressant not even work because the whole reason they're depressed is because of the antipsychotic med? That's a great question. I think you can answer that for me. What do you think? I just told you the pathway. What do you think? So an uh, antidepressant wouldn't be effective. No, it wouldn't work because it's secondary depression. Well, it's not even really depression. It would be called, technically, we call it um, negative symptoms secondary to antipsychotic medications. Negative symptoms, okay. there's no affect. That's negative. They're just like very flat, right? Okay. What happens if you miss that? Let's say, for instance, you weren't paying attention to my class and you got lucky and you passed the course and you were practicing. Patient's going to come to you. You're going to give them Prozac. You're going to keep increasing and it's not going to work because you missed that important detail that the, the antipsychotic medications that you gave were actually worsening it. That's why patients end up in polypharmacy, right? Many times... Clinicians, psychiatrists, or NPs, you know, we lump them together, doesn't matter, you know, don't do a good job of asking good clinical questions and they miss that important detail and patients are suffering because they didn't do a good interview and they didn't put two and two together that maybe the side effects that they're experiencing are symptoms that were caused by you or caused by the last provider, right? So sometimes less is more. So a lot of times, instead of adding another medication, right, which has a higher risk of causing side effects, reducing the dose, the dose, right? Or there could be two medications counteracting each other and you might have to stop one med, right? This is just a very early like understanding of it, but this is already framing how I want you guys to look at psychopharmacology, all right? You have to be like a detective. What pathway is involved, right? What neurotransmitter is involved, right? What are the medications doing in the brain, right? If someone is on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, we're increasing serotonin. Is the side effect due to having too much serotonin, all right? They're also on a D2 blocker. Is the side effect due to a too much dopamine blockade, right? Is it an interaction between the SSRI and the antipsychotic medication, right? Those are all possible. Depending on the medication, it can happen. So we need to kind of troubleshoot that, all right? Pharmacokinetics versus pharmacodynamics, building off we just talked about. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the medication. Very simple, all right? It has four parts to it. Absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion. I'm sure you guys learned a lot about this in pharmacology, but I'll just review it if you don't remember it. Absorption, you know, is pretty much what it is, right? How is it absorbed through the body? And bioavailability is the way we looked at that, right? So if something is not really bioavailable, you need 
you need to give more of the medicine for it to be significant, right? That's why typically when you give someone oral dose, it tends to be higher than the IV dose usually, right? Because when you go to IV, it doesn't go to first pass and all of that medicine is going, sublingual as well, okay? Or inhaled. Distribution. Is it distributed in fat? Is it distributed in protein, right? Some of our medications, uh, if someone is homeless or has an eating disorder and their you know, albumin is low, they might be at more risk for side effects because the medication is highly protein bound. If they don't have a lot of protein, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be free and it's gonna all go to their brain, right? Metabolism. Metabolism has to do with, you know, how, how strong is their liver or their kidneys, right? The kidney does metabolize some of the medication as well. And obviously excretion. Is it sweat? Is it urine? Is it feces? Usually it's a little bit of both, okay? CYP drug interaction. This is very important. I'm going to keep reviewing this the whole course, right? Because I really want you guys to understand this. You have inhibitors. An inhibitor will actually increase the dose of any medication that you give that's metabolized by a specific substrate. So I'll give you an example, all right? A medication is metabolized by CYP2D6, which is one of the main CYP uh, you know, enzymes that we have in the body for psych. If you give someone a, a CYP2D6 inhibitor, right, it's going to inhibit the production of CYP2D6. Therefore, there's not going to be enough 2D6 to metabolize the drug. What's going to happen? The drug is going to increase. Therefore, the patient will have a risk of toxicity and a risk of side effects, right? I'm going to say that again. If you give or a patient takes an inhibitor of a specific CYP, let's say 2D6, right, it's going to inhibit that 2D6 enzyme, right? which means that there's not enough enzyme to metabolize the medications. Therefore, the, metaboli the, the medication is gonna spike, leading to toxicity or side effects, okay? Inducers. Inducers are diet or medications that will increase the amount of CYP enzymes. Therefore, what happens when you have a lot more of the CYP enzymes? It's gonna break down the medications faster, right? Therefore, the patient might not have an effect, right? You're giving me antipsychotic medications, I'm still psychotic, right? Because they were given an inducer, which eats up the medication too fast, all right? An inhibitor, this is important as well, make sure you write this down. Inhibitor is fast. So if you give someone an inhibitor, let's say for instance, grapefruit juice is a very strong three, four inhibitor, right? That's why we tell patients not to drink grapefruit juice or eat grapefruit. Because if you're taking a statin or you're taking blood pressure medication and you take grapefruit juice, it's gonna increase the dose of the blood pressure, you're going to bottom out, you can get hypovolemia, and you can hit your head, and you can die, right? An inducer is slow. It takes a while for your body to build up those SIP enzymes, right? So that might take a week to 10 days. Therefore, you might not see that right away. So for instance, smoking is a 1A2 inducer, okay? So if someone is taking a 1A2 medication, and they start smoking cigarettes, they might, not, they might not notice that right away, right? And after a week, they're still taking the meds. All of a sudden, they're psychotic. It's not working. Why? Because they are inhaling smoke, which is a 1A2 inducer, which builds up 1A2 enzymes, which takes time, and it eats up all their psychotic, their, their uh, antipsychotic medication. Therefore, it's not working, okay? Inhibitors, very fast. You take that medication, you drink grapefruit juice, all your meds are going to go up, okay? Inducers, slow. One week to 10 days. Okay. Same with rapid metabolizers and slow metabolizers. The only difference is that that's genetics. All right. I'll give you an example. Uh, Southeast Asian uh, people, right, of Southeast Asia are 1A2 slow metabolizers. If I give them medication for 1A2, they have higher risk of developing toxicity because they're slow metabolizers. They naturally don't make a lot of those enzymes. So you have to go half the dose with them or go slower or else they're going to at risk for, you know, toxicity or side effects. Someone who is a rapid metabolizer, right? You're gonna have to give them higher doses of medication for that to work. How would you figure that out? What do you think? If they're a rapid or a slow metabolizer? Besides, you know, the obvious, they're having side effects or it's not working. Plasma levels. Phenotyping. Yes, very good. Those are both correct, right? You can do plasma levels, and usually we have defined plasma levels based on regular metabolizers, what it should be based on a specific dosage, right? So for instance, someone who's on olanzapine, which is antipsychotic and mood stabilizer, 10 milligrams, in my head, I know regular levels are, are double the daily dose. So for instance, someone who's taking 10 milligrams of olanzapine, once it hits steady state, which is about a week, 
they should have a level of about 20 nanograms per ml, right? So if I if I do the level and they're taking the medication and their level is 20 nanograms per ml, I assume they're regular metabolizers, right? Assuming they're taking the meds every day, okay? If all of a sudden I do the level and, you know, I know they're taking the meds every day because their partner's telling me they're giving it to them, they see them swallowing it, and their level is 10 nanograms per ml, half of that. Are they going to be rapid metabolizers of 1A2 or are they slow metabolizers of 1A2? What do you think? Shout it out. Rap rapid. rapid. Very good. Rapid, right? Because I'm expecting it to be 20, but it's actually 10. It's lower because that means their body is overproducing the enzyme that's breaking down the medication. Okay. That's important. Pharmacodynamics. How does it work in the body? All right. So we classify meds based on what do they do, right? D2 antagonists, blocks dopamine, right? 5-HT2A antagonists. So 5-HT means serotonin, by the way. I use them interchangeably. You tell me if you want me to say 5-HT or serotonin. It really doesn't matter to me. All right. 5-HT2A antagonist or dopamine antagonist. Is it a 5-HT2A agonist or is it D2 agonist? All right. Is it a D2 partial agonist? right? Or is it a histamine inverse agonist? See what I'm saying? You have to understand all these concepts, okay? I teach clinicals also, so I do have, I actually have nine students in me this semester for clinicals. And whenever I have them see patients and, you know, we round on the patients, okay, you spoke to the patient, they're experiencing this side effect, you tell me, is it a pharmacokinetic interaction? Is it a pharmacodynamic interaction? Or is it both? Sometimes it's both, right? Pharmacokinetic uh, interaction. Tell me, why is it a pharmacokinetic interaction? Well, they were doing fine in the meds, but they wanted to go on a diet and they felt like they were getting sick and they started drinking grapefruit juice. Perfect. That's great. What's happening? Grapefruit juice is an inhibitor and it's increasing their dose of their medication. All right. Or pharmacokinetic interaction. They were doing well in the meds and they came back this month and, you know, the meds aren't working anymore. What happened? Well, they started smoking cigarettes. So now they're eating up all that medication. Right. Perfect. Good. Pharmacodynamic interaction. What happened? Well, I thought the patient had ADHD and now they're psychotic or manic because they gave them the wrong medication. Pharmacodynamic, right? I wanted to block D2. I, I thought I was increasing D2 to help the patient, but by increasing D2, I made them psychotic because I was increasing dopamine in the wrong pathway in the mesolimbic area, right? So it's a pharmacodynamic interaction, all right? Wrong target. Hit the wrong target, right? I thought I had to block, I thought I had to increase dopamine, but in reality, I had to block dopamine, right? They always kind of work together. There's usually a little bit of both, all right? But that's usually the end effect of what we see, right? At the end effect is, is the patient happy with the meds or not happy with the meds? If the patient says, I'm not happy with the medications, why are you not happy? I feel more flat. So maybe it was a pharmacodynamic interaction. I wanted to block dopamine in the mesolimbic area, but I blocked dopamine too much in the mesocortical area, right? And now they can't feel pleasure. Pharmacokinetic interaction. Well, you know, they thought they had COVID, so they went to the store and they bought, you know, vitamin C. And now their stimulant is not working anymore because stimulants like Adderall need to be in a basic environment because they're weak bases. If someone takes vitamin C, what's another name for vitamin C? Ascorbic acid. It's an acid. Once you're, and once the pH of your stomach starts to go down, all that amphetamine, right, or Adderall is being excreted out faster. So they're spitting it out. It's a pharmacokinetic interaction. All right. If I told you I gave someone Adderall and they became psychotic, is it a pharmacokinetic interaction or a pharmacodynamic interaction? Pharmacodynamic. Very good. Someone goes to the health food store and buys chamomile tea, starts drinking chamomile tea, now is having akathisia from their medication. Pharmacokinetic interaction or pharmacodynamic interaction? Pharmacokinetic. Pharmacokinetic. Very good. Someone is smoking cigarettes and now their meds are not working. Pharmacokinetic interaction, pharmacodynamic interaction. Pharmacokinetic. Very good. Pharmacokinetic interaction. All right. Someone who's on antipsychotics, I give an antidepressant for depression. It's not working. Is it a pharmacodynamic interaction or pharmacokinetic interaction? Dynamic. Very good. Boom. You're done. Finished. That's it. Lecture's over. Class is over. The last class isn't over. But it's really up to you guys now to, to make the best out of this. So I'll give you a few minutes. Think about what I said. I have no problem repeating it again. A lot of material. I can give you examples. But, you know, I want you guys to really, you know, think critically of what, what I told you and try to understand it. All right. I have a question. Yes. For the, um, 
the dopamine pathways when you're um determining when there's like a side effect happening um you know say like amenorrhea when do you determine if you're going to use a partial agonist or if you're going to like decrease the medication or change the medication when do i decide yeah like is it dependent on the pathway and the symptoms presenting that you decide if you're going to lower like yes. antipsychotic or yes, like add a agonist because there's many other things that, that can increase prolactin right for instance mm -hmm. Uh, anxiety, stress, sex, right? If you were doing prolactin and someone had sex the night before and there was nipple stimulation, I've seen it, it happens, right? You have to ask the patient, right? Um, something called a prolactinoma, which is a non-cancerous tumor, which I've seen also in clinical practice that can also increase prolactin. But that increase is like 10 times. Like the prolactin will be like 800 or 500, right? Hyperprolactinema based on D2 blockade is usually like 50, 60, I think I've seen a hundred on high dose of respiratory. Yeah. But if it's like in the hundreds, I would definitely send them to neurologists and they would have to rule out prolactinoma. I don't even, I won't even waste their time. Like the meds are not going to increase it that much. Please go to neurologists and, and make sure that you do a, a, a scan, a brain scan to rule that out. Can we uh, review examples of the pathways again? Yes. Let me open up the pathways in a second. All right, dopamine pathways. All right, so the one that, that you need to know is called the mesolimbic pathway, which is from the VTA, ventral strike. It doesn't say it here, but I'm going to say it to you as VTA, which stands for ventral, ventral, tegmentum area to the nucleus accumbens, right? Mesocortical pathway is the ventral tegmental area or VTA to the DLPFC. D stands for dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, DLPFC. So it's connection from the ventral tegmental area to the DLPFC, and that would be the mesocortical pathway. Right. Nigrostriatal, which is for movement, goes from the substantia nigra to the basal ganglia. All right. Tubero infundibular pathway goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. So those are the main pathways. Mesolimbic, VTA to the nucleus accumbens, mesocortical, VTA to the D as in dog, L, P, F, C, dorsal, lateral, prefrontal cortex. Okay. Nigrostriatal, which is substantia nigra to the striatum or basal ganglia and tubero infundibular pathway, which is from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, all right? Too much dopamine in the mesolimbic area is implicated in mania and psychosis, all right? So that means there's too much dopamine there. Not enough dopamine in the nigrostriatal area is gonna affect movement. It can cause Parkinsonism, shuffling gait, bradykinesia, which is slow movement, Stiffness, muscle spasms like dystonia, that's all movement. That's all nigrostriatal pathway, all right? Mesocordial pathway, mesocortical, has to do with focus and attention, sustained attention. Sustained attention is kind of like what you guys are doing now, right? You're sustaining your attention, trying to listen to me. If you are getting distracted pretty easily, there might be an impairment in your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So therefore, I might need to increase dopamine there, all right? Tubero and fundibular area, there usually is a decent amount of dopamine just to inhibit prolactin release, right? If you're not breastfeeding female. So if you block dopamine there, or there's a dysfunction in dopamine there, you're going to elevate prolactin. Older textbooks used to call dopamine prolactin inhibitory hormone, PIH. So you might see that in much older textbooks because they, they knew right away that 
dopamine, right, was was inhibiting prolactin. So what happens? You inhibit dopamine. It's a double negative. You disinhibit prolactin. Therefore, and prolactin will rise up, leading to hypoprolactinemia, which long term for females can cause, you know, osteoporosis. It can cause infertility. You know, it can also lead sometimes to prolactinoma, which is a tumor because it's over secreting prolactin. So these are just some basic, you know, for men, sexual dysfunction, gynecomastia, which usually will manifest as like sensitivity in their breast area. Like oh, some of my patients will say, well, you know, my nipple now is very sensitive, right? Was it sensitive before? No, it just started when, I, when you started me on this medication. Right away, I probably want to address that right away. All right. Because remember, once you grow breasts, unfortunately, unless you get it surgically removed for a male, you know, it, it, it doesn't go back to the way it was. All right. So you want to get that, you know, early because that can really be bad for them. Called gynecomastia. Any other questions? We have a half hour, so make the best of your time. There was a SIP chart on like the week one, but when you open it, when you open it, it's not there. There's no chart there. Okay, I'll I'll double check. It might have. It's called the Flockhart table. So if you okay. want to Google that, F L O C K H A R T Flockhart. But I'll speak to Professor Smith because he's the one that kind of adds stuff to there. I'm not that tech savvy when it comes to, to Brightspace, but we'll make sure it's fixed. But if you want to get ahead of it, a uh, Flockhart, F-L-O-C-K-H-A-R-T, Flockhart table. And it's going to give you all the significant enzymes and interactions that you need. It'll say, you know, grapefruit juice, 3A4 inhibitor, right? It'll say, you know, certain drug-drug interactions. You know, Unless you're a maniac like me, I don't expect you guys to memorize all the interactions. Somehow I'm able to memorize all that stuff, but you guys don't need to do that. All right, refer to tables. It really is helpful. Just know the significant ones, right? Chamomile tea, people drink that because it makes them calm, sleepy time tea. Grapefruit is pretty common. Um, what else is pretty common? Also, you know, primary care will prescribe a lot of like, you know, drugs that have interactions too, like ciprofloxacin is a 1A2 inhibitor, right? Cipro, that's pretty common. Antifungal meds, like diflucan is a 1A2 inhibitor. That's pretty common too, right? Omeprazole is pretty common, proton pump inhibitor. That's, a, that's an inducer. So these are just things that I share with a lot of my other colleagues that I see on a regular basis. So as soon as I see it, the reason why your meds are not working is because they gave you omeprazole, right? Like, oh, how'd you know that? Like, well, it's pretty common. You think I'm a genius, but it's it's just I see it so much. And once meds stop working, you kind of know what, what's common. They'll say, well, my doctor gave me something for my stomach. All right, your meds aren't working? Yes. How did you know? You probably gave you omeprazole, right? Yes. Okay. Have your doctor change it to pentoprazole. Doesn't It's not an inducer. All right. I have a UTI. Okay, great. Your doctor might offer you Cipro. Please do not tell them to give you Cipro. Please tell them you're taking a medication that interacts with Cipro. It's a 1A2 inhibitor. Because if someone's on clozapine and they get Cipro, it can kill the patient because it can it can 10 times the dose of clozapine, which is a very toxic medication. All right. Also, if they have a fungal infection, please tell your doctor that you're on this medication. Do not give you diflucan because, you know, it could kill you. And you'd be surprised. Some doctors will still do it and you have to call them and explain it to them. But again, you know, you want to make sure we tell our patients ahead of time to tell the, you know, tell the doctors not to do that. I usually give them like a list of what meds are important. And I say, please bring this to your next appointment. Because remember, we're only psychiatric providers, so a lot of other specialists will kind of not will take it for granted. But they don't they don't appreciate that a lot of our meds work in the brain and could be very you know very bad for our patients. I also saw like the beers criteria listed on the week one. Yes. Beers is important when we start talking about geriatric psychiatry. So beers has to do with um, anticholinergic burden. All right. So obviously our body needs acetylcholine to focus. So if you give someone a lot of anticholinergic medications, you're blocking acetylcholine. Therefore, a patient might have symptoms similar to ADHD. So let's say an older patient comes to you, right? So they say, Agatha, I don't know what's going on. My mom all of a sudden now is being forgetful. It must be Alzheimer's. 
And you say, no, no, it can't, it could be, right? Let me look at the med regimen first, right? You look at the meds, okay, they're taking cogentin three times a day. They got put on Lasix because they have hypertension. They're also on muscle relaxants for, for muscle spasm. Those are all meds in the BS criteria that can worsen cognition, right? Those are anticholinergic medications. So what do you do? Well, maybe it's good to talk to your primary care doctor, whoever's prescribing these meds for your mother, that these meds are interacting, right? Or maybe I'll adjust my medication because my medication is also anticholinergic. And I don't want it to contribute to your mother's medication. So we'll reduce it, all right? So that's what the BS criteria is. It's medications that are very anticholinergic that we should, you know, use cautiously or avoid with patients, you know, of older age. Thank you. By the way, your cohort is only the second cohort that has a live lecture. We used to teach this without any professors. So all the people that graduated to Stony Brook like a year before you guys took Psychopharm without a professor. So please take advantage of the fact that I'm here, utilize me, ask me questions. Can you explain the vesicular transporters? Yes. So vesicular transporters are pumps inside of a neuron, like I said, to recycle it, right? I'm going to show you guys a picture in a later lecture, but if you could just visualize it now, it's something that's inside of a neuron. So it's intracellular, right? It's not outside of the cell. So it's an intracellular vacuum that vacuums up any neurotransmitters that somehow make it inside the cell through the serotonin transport system or neck. So in order to recycle a neurotransmitter, it has to go to two pumps, actually. First of all, it needs to be sucked, it has to be sucked in extrasynaptically through a serotonin transport pump, right? That's one. Now it's inside the neuron, right? So now it's it's sitting inside the cytoplasm, right? It has to go in from the cytoplasm now inside the vesicles to be recycled. And that recycle pump is called a vesicular monoamine mono transport, VMAT. VMAT is a vesicle. It sucks it up inside the vesicles, and then it, once inside the vesicles, it gets recycled, quote unquote. Which is significant where treating chronic dyskinesia um, and treating, um, what's another thing? Are those, only, are those only in the free synaptic? Um... Uh, the, the VMAT? Yeah. yeah. Usually it's in the presynaptic, that's correct. Yeah, usually. Unless it's the postsynaptic communicating with the presynaptic, right? Retrograde neurotransmitters, transmitters, then of course it would also be postsynaptic. But we have more anterograde than we have retrograde, if that makes any sense. Majority of it is going to be retrograde. So most of the it will be anterograde. I apologize. Most of it will be anterograde, going from pre to post. Not many are going in, uh retrograde, going from post to pre. So so most of the diffusion into the post and or, or movement into the post synaptic is really just diffusion, right? There's not like pumps that have to all the pumps and everything. No, and, that's not and no. then there's also some diffusion presynaptic. The pumps are not diffusion. The pumps need energy. They need ATP. So it's not diffusion. Remember, diffusion goes from high to low without, without energy being used, right? You guys can remember that. There is going to be some diffusion, but if you talk about pumps, that requires energy. So that would be considered active transport. Yeah. And the pumps are all just really for reuptake, right? Like, Correct. Yes. There's no pumps in the, in the post right. unless you're unless you're talking retrograde. All right. Usually, uh, yes. Usually, usually. Sure. So I'm drinking coffee, which is classified as what? What is caffeine? Stimulant. Yes, but what what what? Amino acid does it work on? What neurotransmitter? Adenosine. Adenosine. It's an adenosine antagonist. We'll talk about adenosine when we talk about sleep wake disorders, but just something to think about. So adenosine builds up and gets you tired, right? Think of adenosine. You need adenosine to make ATP, right? ATP is energy. 
So if a patient comes to you, I'm just tying everything together so it makes sense to you. It's not just in the book. It's not nebulous. But if a patient comes to you and says, Robert, you know, I'm not tired. I'm, not, I'm you know, there's something wrong with me. I'm not tired. And you say, okay, what did you do today? I just laid in bed all day. All right. Well, you're not burning energy. Why would you be tired? You're not creating ATP. You're not building up adenosine, right? If someone's running around and they're working like two, two jobs, why do they drink Red Bulls, drink coffee to get through? Because you're building up adenosine which is kind of like making ATP to burn energy and making you tired as the day goes on. You need to build a certain amount of ATP or adenosine to get tired. If you're not building up adenosine, no wonder you're not sleeping at night, right? And that'll happen with depressed patients. That's why we need to activate them. Part of therapy is you have to try to force yourself as much as you can to get out of bed. If you just lay in bed all day, you know, your cycle is going to be all up. You know, you need, we need to help you get out of bed and, and move around just a little bit. Slowly, obviously, it's not going to be drastic, but you can't just give them meds and they lay in bed all day and, you know, just, they're not going to get that much better. Professor, yes. can you explain the agonist spectrum again, please? The agonist spectrum? Yes. Sure. Yes. Let me Thank open that. You. Okay, agonist spectrum, all right? So agonist will mimic the natural neurotransmitter of the body, all right? Whether it's mimicking serotonin, dopamine, or epinephrine, histamine, acetylcholine, you name it, right? Pretty much the body can't tell the difference between the medication or your body's naturally occurring neurotransmitter, right? A partial agonist is also called a stabilizer. In the presence of too much neurotransmitter, a partial agonist is gonna reduce that. That's why it's called the stabilizer, right? In the presence of not enough neurotransmitter, you give someone a partial agonist, it's actually going to increase it, all right? So it, work, it can work both ways. An antagonist is just going to block that postsynaptic receptor, all right? But there's still going to be intrinsic activity because, like I said, intrinsic activity is just the daily day-to-day -day stuff that that neuron needs to do to function, right? Intrinsic activity. Inverse agonist stops it, stops all the activity. So there's not going to be any intrinsic activity either, all right? Once again, agonist could be a stimulant. An agonist could be, you know, an antidepressant, all right? Psychedelic, for instance, right? A psychedelic medication is a 5-HT2A, serotonin 2A agonist, right? Helps with depression. Level. A partial agonist could be Abilify for a psychosis. Um, or if you, when you talk about opioid use disorder, you know, what is buprenorphine or Suboxone? It is a partial agonist opioid receptor, right? An antagonist. We have many antagonists in psychiatry. We love antagonists. Majority of our meds in psychiatry are blockers, right? A lot of the newer meds now are actually agonists. So we're moving away from antagonists in psychiatry towards agonists. The majority of our meds are still antagonists, all right? Inverse agonists, also a new concept. We only have quite a, we only have a few inverse agonists, but I foresee in the next couple of years, we probably will have a lot more inverse agonists, all right? Does it answer your question, Sarai? Yes, thank you. The style book is a great analogy for agonists. Figure two to eight. Yeah. Like a light bulb. That's another one. That's good. Another example I like to use is a leaky faucet. All right. Imagine in your house, in your in your bathroom, you have a little bit of a leaky faucet that's dripping, you know, water now and then, right? That water dripping is considered residual activity, right? Assuming you don't call the plumber to fix it, it's gonna keep dripping, right? You give someone an agonist, that's you opening the faucet, right? It's gonna spit out water. Boom. You give someone an antagonist, the faucet is still leaking. You close the valve, but it's still leaking a little bit, right? An inverse agonist is you actually calling a plumber and then sh and shutting off the valve. There's not even a leaky faucet anymore. Get it? That would be an inverse agonist. Please ask questions now if it's not clear. There's no stupid questions. I don't judge. I get paid not to judge. I just have one more question that's not directly yeah. related to this material, but um, are you going to be doing another lecture before our next, before like on weeks three through five? 
Yeah, every every three every three chapters are going to be lecture done. The reason why okay. I want to make sure you understand this now because everything builds. So literally going from, let's say if we're lifting weights, we're going from like 100 pounds to 500 pounds. So if this is complicated now, it gets much harder later on. So I want to make sure that you're all kind of on the same page and understanding it. Because everything builds off this. As we keep going up, we, we add weights pretty drastically. So if you don't understand the concepts now, you're just going to get lost. I don't want anyone to get lost. Are those dopamine pathways in the textbook, like uh, like an outline? Yes, they're in, the, they're in the style textbook, actually. Okay. Definitely memorize those pathways. You'll need that. I just want to clarify something you said. Are we responsible for the cascade? a uh, portion or just kind of understanding the general gist of it or do we need to know like that it activates kind like kinase or whatever i was reading oh, the phosphatase and the kinases yeah. i want to but i don't want to torture you guys i won't okay because i was finding that very difficult <laughs> it's good to understand it but at this point in your career it's, it's okay Now you guys know why I want you to read ahead, right? Because then we can kind of clarify stuff and just go over examples. Because I don't want to read the book to you again. You know, we're all adults here. So, I mean, I don't mind, but it's better if we keep it high level and we, when we tie concepts together. Because as we get, like I said, as it, as it gets heavier and heavier and the material gets a lot more, we still combine pharmacokinetic interaction, pharmacodynamic, and then I start telling you patients on three meds and I give you a bunch of symptoms and you have to kind of figure out what's happening. So it's many concepts that you need to start learning how to see things now. Sometimes it's like, how do you, how do you think as a psychopharmacologist, right? Because there's many concepts that tie together. So start thinking like that now and it gets easier over time. Don't just memorize depression, Prozac, depression, Zola, right? Bipolar disorder, lithium. That's not going to get you very far. I will be honest, there's many colleagues of mine that practice that way, but I hope you guys don't. They have a lot on um the transporters on like the gene fam the gene families. Do we need to know like what transporters in what gene family? Yeah, like L S L C three six eight four. Correct. No, you need it's okay. Okay. All right. I've taught this class so many times I have like the book memorized already. <laughs> but no, you need to know that. But just understand that if you do genetic, the reason why S L C six three eight four is significant, and you might know it. Is because if a patient comes to you and says, here, and you look at the paper, like, oh, what's this? My last doctor did genetic testing on me. It says I'm a CL SLC36A4, uh, long, long, uh, homogenous, you know, carrier. What does that mean? You might need to explain it to them. So what that means is that your mom has a long gene, your dad has a long gene. Therefore, you have more serotonin transporters. What that means is that you might be more sensitive to serotonin reuptake. Therefore, I might prescribe you Zoloft because it might be beneficial for you. If someone comes to you and gives you that paper and says, I did an SLC6384 test and I carry short for both systems. My mom is short my, and my dad is short. Okay. Unfortunately, you might be a poor responder to serotonin reuptake, right? But again, studies for that is inconclusive because depending on your ethnicity, that might not be significant, right? With Caucasians, it might be significant, but with you know Blacks or Latinos or Asians or mixed, it might not be significant. So therefore, genetic testing is not really significant at this point. Don't let the other providers fool you and say it's important. At this point, it's not practical. I do genetic testing once in a while, but I don't think it really helps anybody at this point. But you will see that in studies. Long, long carriers of SLC6384, they'll say they might respond better to serotonin reuptake pumps, right? And short, short carriers might not. It gets really fun though. Once you learn everything, it, it, it opens up a whole new world of like, you know, understanding medicine and, and being able to help your patients. It's almost like a cheat code.
And if you think psychopharma is hard, wait till you get to clinicals and we start talking about labs and differential diagnosis. Is it hypothyroidism or is it depression? But I teach that class too, so don't worry, I'll help you. You have 10 minutes. Make the best of this time, please. I don't mind repeating things over and over again. It doesn't matter to me. And you can always reach out to me by email if you know there was something that wasn't, you know, that wasn't clear. I'll be more than happy to respond to it through email. If it needs a more specific explanation, I'll be more than happy to log to hop on a five or ten minute Zoom call with you and explain it to you. It's not a problem. And please watch the YouTube videos, all right? Because there might be some things that I covered last semester that I'm not able to cover with you guys now, but it might be on the exam. Only because there's so much material. To be honest with you, I could teach this whole 16 week course just in chapter one to three. That's how much material there is on it. But obviously I'm gonna streamline it a little bit more so that you know you, you get the general sense of it. As you guys get to the clinical part, 517, 527, 37, 47, we're just gonna keep building and, and reflecting back so eventually you'll get everything by the end of the of the course, hopefully. Um, will there be any type of review before the exam? Fortunately, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a lot of info. <laughs> I, know, I know. Like I said, it's going to be the hardest class you've taken in your life, but the most rewarding. And I'm here to help you. All right. I'm not here to fail anybody. I know it's a hard class. Please reach out to me by email. I'll be more than happy to explain that again on the Zoom call for five or 10 minutes if you want. All right. Or watch my YouTube videos. I'm explaining this stuff again. I think I spoke about Mesolimbic pathway for like 45 minutes last semester. Have you had a people fail your course before? Yes, I have. I have. Yes. I'm not proud about it. I want every student to pass. Like I said, I'm not here to fail you. But again, it's my duty to make sure that I graduate, you know, competent psychiatric nurse practitioners, right? So I'm not gonna pass someone if I feel like there would be a danger to the patients. So if you put in the effort, you will pass my you will pass my class. Can you explain the upper regulation and down regulation again? Does it have to do with bonds or I'm sorry, does it have to do with what? Tolerance. With what? I'm sorry? Like um being like tolerance to the medication or yes it is it does have that's that's one of the concepts of tolerance so for instance um you know your body will always want to do the opposite of what you're doing artificially right if you just think about that you can understand it so my body right now is used to a specific dopamine tone for instance right let's say it's moderate so if I accidentally took Haldol which is a dopamine blocker right my brain is not used to having less dopamine hitting that receptor right I'm taking Haldol what's gonna happen. I might feel sedated in the beginning because my body's not used to, you know, that dopamine blockade, but eventually my brain is going to adapt to it. Is it going to start increasing my dopamine receptors or is it going to start decreasing my dopamine receptors because dopamine receptors are being blocked? What do you think, Jennifer? Increase or decrease? Increase. Very good, right? Because it wants to go back to that state of what it was before. So it's going to upregulate, right? Which is called up, which increases. What's going to happen? It's going to become more sensitive or less sensitive? Desensitize or sensitize? Um... Sensitized. Very good, right? Because it wants to get as much dopamine tone as it can. It wants to be as sensitive as possible. It's going to increase, upregulate, and it's mm -hmm. going to sensitize, become more sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. The opposite is going to happen. I, okay. I'm having fun. This is hypothetical. I'm having fun on a Saturday night. Someone passes me a dopamine agonist that I sniff up my nose, right? What's going to happen? I'm going to feel great. I keep abusing that. My dopamine receptors, I want to protect myself. What's going to happen? Are they going to downregulate? Or are they going to upregulate from an agonist? Downregulate. Very good, right? I'm taking cocaine. I'm sniffing cocaine, theoretically. Obviously, mm -hmm. my receptors are going to go down because they want to protect me, right? Or else I become psychotic. Whatever happens first. Usually, psychosis will happen first because it takes time for your receptors. Remember, it's a cascade effect for the G proteins to kind of work, right? Like I mentioned before, it's a G protein uh, uh, mediated concept. So before my G proteins can start working, first, second, third, fourth messengers to increase or downregulate those receptors, I'm probably gonna get psychotic first. But what's gonna happen? For, but after that, I might not get a psychotic, I might not get the euphoria, my receptors gonna downregulate, I might need to get a higher hit of 
dopamine, right? Give me more, give me more cocaine, right? Because I need to max that out. There's a concept called drug holidays for any of you who are RNs on inpatient floor. Sometimes you'll see that in the medics, they'll say drug holiday. They don't do that as much anymore. Uh, drug holiday means that you stop all medications and give them a chance for the receptors to go back to the way they were. Called drug holiday, right? They'll, they'll go back. The problem with that is you have higher risk of withdrawal. People will have withdrawal side effects. If you watch the video from week one from last semester, it'll explain everything I spoke about today too. We talked about similar stuff. Are you going to post this video on YouTube or is it just going to be a link in the announcements? No, I'm going to post all this on YouTube. I think it's easier. Okay. That way. If everyone subscribes to the channel, it just it's easier. It just keeps going on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to get enough followers on YouTube so I might be able to change careers and just, you know, live off the, the royalties from this. Good luck. Good luck. Yes, Ashley. The question? So I know that um that anxiety and psychosis are clumped together. I think for your benefit, for the class's benefit, I'm gonna break it down to two two lectures. So I'll probably add an extra lecture for schizophrenia. Plus, I specialize because schizophrenia is my thing. Like I treat schizophrenia all day, every day, and I love schiz treating schizophrenia. It's so fascinating. And I'll I'll go over all the meds that I use to prescribe to treat patients, how to get them better. So I'll break that down also. I'll make that a separate lecture for you guys. So I'll do a separate lecture for schizophrenia. And we'll talk about all the antipsychotic medications. And we'll also review all the pathways for dopamine also. All right. Because there's probably like 10 antipsychotics and they're all very different. And they do different parts in the brain that I can actually break it down. And we can talk which patient presentation might benefit from whichever medication, right? Because there's so many antipsychotic meds. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll place an announcement in the next week or so. Will this be the time slot for most of the lectures or is it gonna change? Uh, no, I think originally uh, Professor Smith said it was what time? 12 to 1.30? Was it 12 to 1.30? I think even 11 it was supposed yes, to be. Yes, yeah. yes, I'm sorry, yes. The reason why I just had to do this later because I had to take my wife to an appointment, but the earlier one actually works better for me. So if you guys don't mind, you know, 11 is probably better, not this late. Yeah, okay. Please make an effort. Like I said, you know, sacrifices are needed, but if you needed to sacrifice or take a day off, it really should be for this course. Cause like I said, this is a very difficult course. So. Form little study groups too, you know, if you like study groups of two or three students to, uh, you know, if you guys can get a study group of like at least five students, I'll dedicate a half hour of my time to explain stuff again, if you guys need it, right? But if it's for one student, I'm very busy, you know, just so you guys know, I, I run the psych program for Child Center of New York, which is a large outpatient. I, I supervise the psychiatrist and the nurse practitioners. So I'm sitting in on meetings, I'm seeing patients, Besides teaching here, I teach for other universities too, so my time is very limited. But if you can get at least five students and give me a day and time that works for you, I promise you I'll make time to dedicate a half hour to explain everything again, all right? Like I said, I don't fail anyone. I really want all of you to succeed. So, you know, even though it's a hard course, just be confident that I'm here to help you and, and form those groups. So if you want to get a group of five and let's say this topic is hard and you want to schedule something next week, we can do a half hour and I'll explain it to all five of you, all right? If it's one student, I could probably only do five or 10 minutes tops. No last, last call, 
No, no one? Okay. Very nice to meet everyone. You know, I appreciate, I want to see your faces because like I said, I teach in all the other classes. So I like to see faces because we'll get to know each other as you guys, um, you know, graduate. You get to know me very well. And like I said, you know, if you need references when you guys graduate or you want to do clinicals with me, you know, if I have space, I'll be more than happy to take students too. I pre sub students as well. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, you can also text me if you want. My phone number is on my on my uh, my thing. Sometimes I'm bad with email, but if there's something urgent, like you can't make a test or whatever, please reach out sooner than later. I'm reasonable. You know, if you give me a valid excuse, I, I can probably move things around if possible. But like I said, I'm only an adjunct. I'm not on faculty. So I'll do the best that I can as an adjunct. But sometimes I might have to refer you to the actual faculty professors. All right. If it's something I can do, I'll ask them and they'll have to approve it. All right. Very nice to meet everyone. Have a nice weekend and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.